Good afternoon and welcome along to the programme. I'm Justin Briley and you're listening to Unbelievable. Between now and four o'clock, I'm going to be joined by a couple of Christian guests uh, debating a particular theological issue. be telling you all about that in a moment's time. Unbelievable is, of course, part of your Saturday lineup of afternoon programming called Faith Explored. And don't forget that straight after today's programme, you can hear the profile interview. So do stay tuned for that as well. Later on in today's show, you're going to be hearing some of the feedback from previous weeks of programming and if you want to find out more about the program maybe check out some of the past podcasts a whole archive of programs for you to explore at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable do hope you enjoy what's coming up on today's show you're unbelievable yes we have uh, two characters who have been on the show a number of times before uh, back for a theological debate today it's a catholic versus protestant show and uh, we're going to be uh, discussing what is the ultimate authority for christians scripture alone or scripture plus well representing the catholic position today peter d williams joins me he's a writer and speaker he's part of catholic voices and uh, the other side of the argument today Today is James White of Alpha and Omega Ministries. I'll be making sure you know how to get hold of both of them via their websites a little later on. But uh, they've both joined me on the programme before, discussing similar issues um, in one way or another. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both for joining me on the programme today. Great to have you with me. Great to be with you. Great to be here. Um, let's uh, first of all go to you, James. You've come the furthest after all. Um, <laughs> I feel honoured. I feel like you've flown in just for me. And, and on this occasion, it, it's almost true I in a way. Be, yeah. um, uh, it, it's great to have you with us. Um, how's things going for you in Arizona? It's starting to cool off, so that's uh, that's a good thing in life, and, okay. uh, for, especially for cyclists like me. It's uh, it, it's beautiful. But uh, just had a book come out, What Every Christian Needs to Know About the uh, Quran, and writing another with Shabir Ali. Uh, Dr. Shabir Ali is pretty well known around the world as one of the leading Islamic apologists. And uh, so uh, keeping really busy with that because he and I are co-authoring a book on the Trinity and Tawheed. Yeah, well, we're looking forward to a, another discussion coming up with you and uh, uh, a Yusuf Ishmael mm -hmm. uh, in due course on the program, and, and that will be fascinating because you've turned a lot of your hand these days to interacting with Islam and the Quran. But you, yeah. at, 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 at bottom, you're still a Calvinist. You, you defend that <laughs> theology so often on your show, uh -huh. in debates, and so on. Um, sola Scriptura. Right is a term not everyone may be familiar right. with. Can you just define what that is and how it plays into today's discussion? Well, historically, uh, the, the phrase is primarily used to define both the, the formal and material principles of the Reformation. One is sola scriptura, providing uh, the, the essence of the epistemological difference between the Protestants and the Roman Catholic Communion. And then uh, sola fide, justification by faith, being the, the essence of what was preached that really started things off. And so sola scriptura is often misrepresented, but fundamentally is the assertion that because scripture is theonustos, because it is God-breathed, that is absolutely unique in its character and unique in its authority, and that while God has established the church, that the church, I'm a, I'm a high churchman, uh, I believe that the church is the bride of Christ, um, in fact, so much so that when 1 Timothy 3.15 talks about the church, it's a pillar and ground of the, of, of the truth, uh, that, as I see it, is about the local church. I mean, um, uh, I'm an elder in a local church. Um, I, For example, this next month, I'm only going to be in my church once in four weeks. <laughs> That's extremely unusual for mm. me. Unlike a lot of apologists who are just gone all the time and don't really have a connection, I regularly preach. Uh, in the church. Very important to keep that local connection. Oh, as far as, uh, as, far as balance is concerned, I'm, that's one of the most important things I would say to anyone who's looking at getting involved in, in apologetics. But I have a very high view of the church, but I believe that the church is subservient to the voice of Christ, which is found solely in the scriptures. So the technical definition is the scriptures are the sole infallible rule of faith of the church. Not that we don't have other rules of faith. Mm. Uh, I'm a Reformed Baptist. We have the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. It, it tells people if they want to know what we believe, there. Mm. I think it's important these days. Yeah, yeah. You ask, what does that church believe? Well, they're not really <laughs> sure. I, I, I don't really. We, we want to be clear in what we're saying to okay, the world. Sure. And so, but that is a subordinate standard. It, mm. is, it must be reformable and correctable by the higher authority of Scripture. Now, okay, a bit of a controversial question coming up, but um, where do you stand then as far as a Roman Catholic is concerned? Do the fact that they differ significantly from you in your view of Scripture, um, do, uh, does that leave them, as it were, 
in any sense outside the fold. As that's, far as you're but that's concerned. not the, that's not the reason that, uh, that that's not the reason that I cannot uh, join hands and say let's just all get together and sing Kumbaya. Okay, um, that's not the reason. The reason's the gospel. Okay. Now, the reason that we differ on the gospel is because we differ on Sola Scriptura. I, I've lost track of how many debates <laughs> I've done with Roman Catholic apologists, around 40-ish, something like that. And whether we're discussing Mary, the Mass, justification, papacy, it, it doesn't matter what the issue is, it always ends up devolving back to this. It, it comes back to what the ultimate authority is. For me, the the dividing line is the issue of the gospel. The sad thing is that if Peter and I stood outside an abortion clinic together, um, I, I am uh, absolutely merciless when it comes to debating abortion. Uh, I'm, I don't I don't take prisoners on on that subject because you're talking life and death stuff. So we would we would we would hit, we would probably be very much in line in mm-hmm. in our views on that and our feelings about those subjects and how we would debate the issues and mm-hmm. things like that. But if someone walked up to Peter and I outside an abortion clinic and said, "What must I do to be safe?" we would not answer in the same way. Mm-hmm. And I believe the reason we would not answer in the same way comes back to this issue. That's why it's so foundational. Okay. Well, we'll, uh, we'll get back to that, I'm sure, in one way or another. Peter D. Williams, our other guest, as we mentioned, on mm-hmm. the program today. Welcome <coughs> back, Peter, as well. Great to be here, as always. Um, tell <laughs> us a little bit, then, um, from your perspective as a Catholic, what you're going to be aiming to defend on today's program. Well, I'm going to be aiming to defend the idea that the ultimate authority for Christians is threefold. It's, well, I suppose more basically we would all agree that the ultimate authority for Christians is God, but the question is, how does God reveal his truth to us, and by what standards are we bound? And I guess for a a Catholic, there are three. Holy Scripture, what we call the sacred tradition of the Church, and what's called the magisterium. Magisterium is a Latin word coming from the the Latin magister, meaning teacher. Mm. So the teaching authority of the Church. So that's that threefold um, triumvirate mm. of authority, which gives the Christian all the truth that we need. Um, and that's all, all those three together are sufficient to function as the ultimate rule of faith. I will be very much contending that Scripture alone isn't sufficient. Uh, scripture, scripture is fundamental, but on its own it cannot give us all the truths that we need. Okay. Um- when it comes to this issue of whether you can join hands with James and sing Kumbaya, do you approach things any differently in the way that he's just spoken? There is a fundamental difference insofar as Catholics confess that anyone who is baptised um, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and confesses at least the vas- basic core, the basic charisma, as it's called, of Christianity, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, at least in its Trinitarian aspects, is our brother or sister in Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that there is an equivalence between the Catholic Church and all the different variants of, of Protestant sect and denomination. We do believe that the Catholic Church is the one true Church in which subsists the fullness of the Church of Christ. We, admit, we certainly recognise that, for example, the Eastern Orthodox, the Oriental Orthodox, and the Assyrian Churches, all the Churches of the East, they are particular Churches, in other words, they have a valid bishop and they have a valid Eucharist and they have valid sacraments, so all seven sacraments. And so those are particular churches, sadly not in full communion with the church, but nonetheless we're hoping to move into full communion. But the difference between them and, and Protestant denominations is that Protestantism has rejected absolutely core and essential elements of Christianity, which would include five of the seven sacraments, which would include so many of what we would call the instruments, the means of grace by which God communicates his grace to his church, which is very, very, a very basic important difference in terms of how you are saved. That's, that's the thing. And I'd love, by the way, for us to debate that at some point. Um, but very much more foundationally, we have a different idea, understanding of authority. And one thing that the, the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox and the Syrian Church of the East all share is a belief in Holy Scripture, sacred tradition, and the and the authority of the church. Now, of course, there's a particular claim that the Catholic Church makes about itself, um, and the, Catholic, the Eastern Orthodox would make a similar claim, and we could have, there's a debate we could have about mm. that. But ultimately, um, script, uh, Scripture alone is something that all the apostolic churches would reject. We all believe that the church and the sacred tradition have a role within the authority of the church. And so do you think that this view is a fairly recent development in terms of church history Yes, very much so. I don't think the early church functioned in terms of sola scriptura at all. Certainly you can pick out little verses uh, from various church fathers which seems to, they seem to be affirming the authority of scripture, and certainly there are many you could pick out, and, but those don't prove sola scriptura. Okay. Well, we're going to get into this. Uh, I know that we're going to have a really 
intelligent debate today because I've got two very intelligent people joining me here in the studio. But they will be very different in their opinions and they won't hold back. I know mm. that too. So uh, I hope you enjoy today's discussion uh, wherever you're coming from on this particular issue. Be interested to hear from you as well, of course, in regard to today's programme. If you've got a view, you'd like to respond to anything, why not email in? That's unbelievable at premier.org.uk. You can also, of course, find us online uh, via Twitter, Facebook. You can send in your comments that way as well in regards to today's programme. I'm on Twitter at UnbelievableJB or Facebook.com slash UnbelievableJB. You can like the show page there and get in touch too. All of those links and more available from the website premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. So let's get into today's discussion. Um, we are going to be talking about this whole area of what the ultimate authority is for Christians. Scripture alone, sometimes called sola scriptura, or scripture plus, and uh, we've already just heard there from Peter D. Williams, our Catholic representative on the program today, about what that might entail. Um, so, just um, where are we going to start on this? Let's come back to you, James. Um, why, for you, is what Peter has just explained there about this triumvirate of authority that he believes is what is modelled in church history and, and from Christ and so on, why is, is, are you simply not convinced by that view of, of things? Well, I don't see it as apostolic, and I don't see that it actually functions that way, because uh, when, you, when you look at, at the claims that Rome makes today, now obviously I see a, a major continuum over the history of the church, uh, I don't see that the church that existed 325 was very much like the church that exists today, especially as far as Rome envisions it. I don't believe there's anyone at the Council of Nicaea, for example, that affirmed the very dogmas that you have to affirm to be de fide to be a Roman Catholic. Give today. me just a couple of examples uh, for it. Purgatory, instance. the uh, primacy of the of the Roman Pope, uh, the, the Marian dogmas were, I mean, bodily assumption of Mary. Uh, these are the issues that you see from a functional perspective. This is the purpose of the Reformation and the, the process of the Reformation. If you say you have three equal authorities, uh, and yet, in the Roman Catholic concept, if I ask the question, well, who defines what is and what is not Scripture infallibly? Uh, well, that's what the Roman Catholic Church does, and it did not happen until 18, uh, April of 1546, the first dogmatic definition of the canon. Uh, who can interpret Scripture infallibly? Uh, it is the Roman Catholic Church. Who can define what is and what is not canon? It's always been enjoyable to me. Uh, I'm sorry, tradition. Who can def define what is and what is not tradition? It's always been interesting to me in my debates uh, when I would bring up patristic sources, quotes from early church fathers that go against the Roman Catholic perspective. I've frequently had uh, Roman Catholic apologists say, well, that person wasn't speaking from tradition. Mm. So you get to pick and choose what is and what is not tradition. And, of course, the final authority as to what tradition says is the Roman Catholic Church. Now, if the Roman Catholic magisterium gets to define what Scripture is and what it says and what tradition is and what tradition says how in the world can the church be under the authority of those of those sources if you define it and what it says how can it correct you so so there's a sort of anarchy that ensues if you it's not, it's not anarchy it's just it's just it's just a non-functional system because once you have infallibly said the the scriptures say this then you cannot be corrected and when i look at for example the the scriptural arguments found the second nicene council in regards to images and i look at the biblical argumentation I don't think you could find a single member of the Pontifical Biblical Institute that would defend what they said as having any meaning as far as having serious exegesis behind it. But you're stuck with the results of it anyways because of the concept of infallibility. And so, again, it comes back to, well, here's my problem. Scripture is theonustos. Tradition is not. Show me where the Bible teaches that tradition is God breathed. God breathed. And show me, mm -hmm. you know, if we can go to we can go to what Paul says about you know, you know, uh, scripture and tradition. Let's let's look at it, let's look at the text. But the point is, from my perspective, it is the <coughs> nature of scripture that makes it absolutely unique mm. and non-repeatable. So obviously, you you're in agreement that scripture is extremely important mm -hmm. in in the way we are to absolutely. gather our teaching and understanding mm -hmm. of the Christian faith, Peter. But it's scripture as mediated by the tradition mm. and teaching of the Catholic Church. Mm. So um, does this result in basically, well, we can have it the way we like it, depending on what the latest 
Well, no, I mean, I'll say two things uh, just to, to start off with. The first thing I would point out is that the scriptures and the tradition, that, that is the sacred teachings of the church brought down to us through history, are something that's recognised by the church. This is a passive process on the part of the magisterium, on the part of the church. The church doesn't determine anything. It didn't say, right, you know what, I like Genesis and I like Revelations and I like Hebrews, so I'll have that. No, they recognise a tradition which was passed down. And actually, I'll just use the canon, because this is a very deep and profound topic which we're not going to completely cover in one hour. We won't. So I'll just provide one argument which I think illustrates why sole scriptura, the idea of scripture alone being our sole uh, ultimate rule of faith, is wrong, and why I think the historic Catholic position of scripture tradition and the teaching of the authority of the church is right. And it is the canon, um, because one of the things that you have to believe in order to assert sole scriptura is the sufficiency of scripture, that scripture is sufficient to give you all the necessary and essential truths of the deposit of faith. Everything you need should be found within scripture. Now, there is obviously one truth. I mean, that, actually, that, that does differ between... Uh, in terms of its scope between different uh, traditions. So, for example, the Anglican Communion says of the sufficiency of the Holy Scriptures in its uh, Article 6 of the 39 Articles, um, Holy Scripture contains all things necessary to salvation. But then in the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, it says it concerns all things necessary for God's own glory, man's salvation, faith and life. That's uh, then repeated by the London Baptist Confession of Faith, which I know that Dr. White will uh, ascribe to. Um, so there's a difference uh, to a certain extent in, the, mm. in terms of the scope of that. But regards of what scope you believe, one of the things you need to know, whether it be just for salvation or for God's glory, man's faith, hope, salvation and life, is what Scripture is. Because Scripture is necessary. That's another aspect of the evangelical doctrines that I've read. Uh, if I go to Wayne Green or anyone else, they affirm the necessity of Scripture. Scripture is necessary because it contains all the truths you need. It's your sole infallible rule of faith. You, you need the Scriptures. Mm. Well, if you need the Scriptures, then clearly you need to know what the Scriptures are. In other words, you need the canon. But nowhere in Scripture does it define what the canon is. It doesn't give you a list. There is no inspired contents page. There's no golden index. There's no way you know from Scripture alone what the canon is. So by definition, Scripture is insufficient to give you something which you need. So, so but, it's, it's, and I'll just finish yeah, on this yeah. point, the canon is a tradition which is passed down. I mean, in other words, the church recognises, you see this in the New Testament, you see Peter recognising that Paul's writings are inspired, for example. So the church recognises what is Theonistus, what is God-breathed. But then later on they disagree over it. I mean, so the reason why at the back of your Bibles you have Hebrews, James, Peter, 2 Peter, 2, 3 John, June, Revelations, is because the early church disagreed over whether or not those books were apostolic and inspired. They were called the anti so the books that were spoken against. there's a circular reasoning here, a circular reasoning within Sola Scriptura, which says yeah, we, it, well, the Bible it's tells just, us exactly what to believe, but... I think, Somehow I think we it's know what the Bible consists of. Yeah, I th and I think therefore it's disproven uh, because it cannot give you that necessary and essential truth. But the tradition that of the canon is passed down. It's something you need. It's a tradition which is outside the scripture which is passed down and then it's recognised authoritatively by the church. Not actually as late as 1546. I'm not going to claim that there was an extraordinary definition before 1546. That's absolutely right. There was the first extraordinary definition. But there are two forms of magisteria, two forms of teaching authority in the Catholic Church. The extraordinary magisterium, when the church specially defines something by a papal definition or by an ecumenical council, and I'll fin finish now, also the ordinary magisterium, which is to say the the fact that the church teaches something consistently for many, 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 many years, okay. that is considered infallible as well. It's not merely the extraordinary definition. So the Trinity was not, for example, just defined at the Council of Nicaea. Okay. It was believed before then. Well, lots to respond to there, James. First of all, though, this chink in your armour, potentially, it's the soul of Scripture armour, which is simply this, this suggestion that, well, you go beyond Scripture by defining what the canon of scripture is because you won't find that within scripture obviously um so you're already at some level dependent upon tradition so as defined by the church as defined by the church so uh, have we already kind of discovered no. a no a not at all a uh, number of years ago i was on a radio program with a uh, then anyways still orthodox roman catholic apologist by the name of jerry matitix and i asked him a question uh, and the question was, Jerry, how did the believing Jew know that Isaiah and Second Chronicles were scripture 50 years before Christ? Hmm. We had just debated uh, the Apocrypha at Boston College. Uh, from, uh, Which is, for those unaware, part of Catholic <laughs> scripture, the, um, the, the... The apocryphal books, yes. the Deuter Chronicles, yes. Mm. I thought you were about to say Boston College <laughs> is actually <laughs> a Catholic institution, <laughs> which uh, some people would actually question, uh, <laughs> given the uh, liberal yeah, yes, uh, exactly. nature of many of the things there. But be it as it may, um, and he, he was pressing this issue of the necessity of church authority, etc., etc. Mm. And so I asked him, how did the believing Jew know that Isaiah and Second Chronicles were scripture? He, he did not have an answer. Some of the answers that have been offered since then, uh, because it's, it's very clear that they did know Jesus held men accountable scripture, and no one ever responded to Jesus going, 
I didn't know that was scripture. Uh, we didn't have an infallible magisterium to tell us that. Uh, the reality is that Jesus held men accountable to scriptures before there was any type of external authority that could have told them what it was. Not only that, if you try to say, well, there was a Jewish magisterium, the Jewish magisterium never held to the inspiration of the very books that Rome now says are, in fact, inspired. And mm -hmm. that's why I've debated oh, that subject a couple of times, especially. <laughs> well, and, and I think anyone can go listen to the two debates uh, we've done on that subject, and I think those, uh, those facts are rather clearly laid out. Not only that, there was no ordinary magisterial statement on this subject because I can trace a line of uh, teachers uh, going back to Jerome all the way through popes uh, all the way to the time of the Reformation where Cardinal Cayetan, who was the man who interviewed mm -hmm. Luther, rejected the Deuterocanonicals in his written works, and that was right before the Council of Trent. Okay. So the point is there was no ordinary. There was, there was two traditions that existed mm -hmm. side by side. Mm -hmm. So if that's the necessary argument, then Rome doesn't have an answer. And just simply saying, well, you need our authority to define your canon is not, a, is not answering the question. It's just moving the, 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 the goalpost or the, the point back one, one point. Where do you get that okay. authority well, to define these what things? I, well, what I want to ask you, though, is how do you, yeah. right. within Scripture... It's via Sola Scriptura define well, the canon of Scripture. Well, part of the answer is found in the, in the answer to the question that I asked Jerry Matatix, and that is, obviously, God has a purpose in the giving of Scripture. And I address this in my book, Scripture Alone. Um, there is an excellent book that I want to recommend to folks uh, that came out last year. I think it might have actually been this year, but it's recent, within, the, within mm. the past 12 months, by Dr. Michael Kruger uh, called The Canon, I think it's The Canon Revisited, it's one of the best books I've seen on this subject, and he really lays it out more fully than I did. But mm. let me just summarize it, and that is the canon is not an, an extra-biblical tradition. The canon is an artifact of revelation. When God wrote, when God inspired the writing of the first books of Scripture, he established a canon by so doing. Now, he knew exactly what it was. Since other books had been written, God was saying, I haven't written every book. And I have not written no books. I have written some books. So I, as an author, I know what the canon of my writings is. I've never had to sit down, open up a, a document, and go, the canon of James White's books, for mm -hmm. that can to exist. I know what I've written. Sure. I know what I've not written. There are other James Whites out there. There's a James E. White. People get me confused with him all the time. Uh, I, oh, didn't, I feel your pain. I didn't, <laughs> uh, oh, 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 no, there's, there's oh, a Peter J. Williams. There's, it's, there's, there's too many Peter, Peter Williams is going on. No, Lots no people about say that. Yeah. Especially here in... I <laughs> <laughs> uh, didn't mean it that way. But anyways, um, so the point is, when I engage in the activity of writing... I am creating the canon. And that's what, that's what God has done in Revelation. Now, the question then becomes, does God have a purpose for us to know what he has and has not inspired? And my, my belief is that he has just as much of, an, of a desire for us to know what he has inspired as he put just as much effort into that as he would into the writing of the scriptures mm. in the first place. And so what mechanism was available for that believing Jew 50 years before Jesus to know had to be sufficient for him to be held accountable to scripture. And that doesn't change afterwards. If in, if in anything, it becomes even clearer in the light of Jesus' ministry and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not looking at, you know, it's not the Council of Jamnia. There was no Council of Jamnia. But uh, it, it's, not, it's not some uh, Jewish thing that, that uh, well, I take that authority, then I take this authority. That will never actually lead you to the proper foundation for defending the canon. All right, All right, response there, Peter. Right, well, just as I'm not going to get drawn into purgatory and the uh, dogmas of Mary, we'd love to debate those, by the way, <laughs> another time. Uh, I'm not going to get drawn into the Deuterocanonicals, Chronicles, but I will draw people to a book called uh, Why Do Catholics Have Bigger Bibles by Gary Machuta, which answers many of the things that <laughs> which uh, Dr. Which is the guy White I debated said. on this very subject. Well, he, wrote that, he wrote that book after he debated Dr. Okay. White. Um, but how did the Jews know Scripture? Through tradition. Clearly, the believing community that we call the Jewish people recognize over time certain things that were inspired, certain things, that, certain prophets, for example. Over time, I don't have to believe that there is just one particular source whereby the Jews had got, got scripture. I don't have to believe actually in an infallible Jewish magisterium because ultimately the magisterium of presumably the Jewish priesthood, certainly the Jewish community as a whole, recognized these books. For Dr. White, he has to show, if he does believe that scripture is sufficient, how a necessary and essential truth is given 
in Scripture. If it's not, then Scripture is not sufficient. And I'm afraid the artifact versus object d- uh, distinction that you make, which I read in your book, simply doesn't answer the question. That's confusing. And that's giving an ontological answer what's, to what's an epistemological question. The question is, how do you know what is canon? How do you know the Scriptures? That's something that's a necessary central truth which should be therefore found in your sufficient rule of faith, the Scriptures. If it's not found therein, the Scriptures are by definition not sufficient. They clearly are something. I mean, it, I don't disagree, incidentally, that the the canon is discerned or dis- uh, is basically came into existence by the fact that God inspired certain books. That's really uncontroversial. We all agree on that. No one says that the Catholic Church determined, in the sense of made, certain books inspired. We all agree that God th- inspired through his action of Theonistos, certain books into existence. The question is, how do we know what is Theonistos? And the very simple answer from history is it's a tradition that comes to us from the early church through the apostles and it's something which is then has to be recognized by the church itself and it does recognize that there is a continue the, such a continuity such a consistency from at least the late fourth century from the councils okay. of hippo and carthage through the recognitions of the popes because those councils are ratified by the popes right through the tradition of the western church so that you can't simply you simply can't say that there isn't we'll we'll get a response from james we're coming up to the our first break and and there's a lot there for james to respond to um we're we're starting off today on the program as we discuss what is the ultimate authority for christians We're, we're asking is it scripture alone or is it scripture plus sacred tradition and the teaching of the catholic church mm. as catholics believe um and so we, we've got to this point of asking how does James White, our Protestant guest on the programme today, justify the, uh, the the canon of scripture if he's not if, if if he isn't going to go beyond scripture alone as it were OK, we'll hear James's response again on this in a moment's time. You're listening to Unbelievable with me, Justin Briley, uh, asking that question today in our Catholic Protestant debate. My guests are Peter D. Williams of Catholic Voices and James White of Alpha and Amiga Ministries. We'll be back in a moment's time. Are we the products of chance or intention? Does the cosmos leave space for God? Does Darwin dispense with God? Does the human mind reflect a mind behind the universe? Exploring the God Question is a new six-part DVD study series investigating a major talking point of our time, science and God. Some of the world's best scientists and philosophers arguing from both sides of the debate with open, frank and rigorous discussion and fascinating results. Exploring the God Question is designed for individual or small group study as well as for schools and public presentation. To order and find out more, visit thegodquestion.tv slash explore. Explore the search for truth. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. You certainly are. I'm Justin Briley, your host for the show today. And uh, don't forget, you can find us online at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. Usually on the show, we get Christians and non-Christians together to do some kind of debate. But today, uh, we're doing one of those inter-Christian debates, though, well, whether one of our guests might term the other a Christian is one of those bigger issues that is, is under discussion. But today, we're specifically focusing down in our Catholic-Protestant debate on the issue of scripture uh, should we turn to that alone as our ultimate authority on faith um, or is it scripture plus some other things well james white is with me he's from alpha and omega ministries you can check them out at aomin.org peter d williams of catholic voices joins me too catholicvoices.org.uk as we ask what is the ultimate authority for christians on the show today don't forget you can get in touch as well be interested to hear from you uh, you can call in you can always leave a voicemail message um, that that option open if you ring 08456 52 52 52 Select the option for leaving a voicemail message for Unbeliever. We'll be happy to play that out on a future edition of the show. But as ever, the email is unbelievable at premier.org.uk. OK, um, just in that last section, James, um, again, Peter was back to this issue of, of, well, how do you define the canon of Scripture without going beyond Scripture, going to some kind of church tradition, authority, um, some kind of the councils and so on, even if you obviously, as you said, believe that the Catholic Church itself never had a kind of really <laughs> united view on Scripture up for a long time. Well, I just think that needs to be defined a little more, though, as to what, what you would turn mm-hmm. to. Um, you, you've said God knows, obviously, exactly what he's written, just as you would know your own canon. 
but then the question is, I suppose, well, how would you know what well, God believes the canon to be? Well, that was addressing the nature of Scripture, and canon flows from the nature of Scripture, mm. obviously. I mean, uh, what uh, whether you call it actively or passively, I've met a lot of Roman Catholics that made very active statements about the ability of Rome to define the canon, but uh, Peter's taking a more passive recognition role. That's, that's fine, that's great, I, I applaud that. But that all flows from what the nature of Scripture is. And if you're going to have anything that's going to be equal to Scripture and authority, it has to have the same nature. And we've not heard even the beginning of a defense of those other uh, uh, sources mm. having that kind of authority. Where does Christ speak? He speaks in his word. Where is the evidence that he speaks in the traditions that have been defined by Roman Catholicism? Now, it was said, well, uh, the Jewish person knew uh, by on the basis of Jewish tradition. I, I dispute that. Uh, there were all sorts of different Jewish traditions, and Jesus rejected a large portion of those Jewish traditions, taught us to do the same thing. And what did he tell us to judge Jewish tradition by? By Scripture. So that would become a viciously uh, <laughs> tight circle that even Jesus was arguing in, and no one ever raised those, those arguments against Jesus when he said, you should have examined these things on the basis of Scripture, and then turns around and calls the Jews hypocrites for not having do done so. So... I'm following, I think, Jesus' pattern there and would say, well, then, then this becomes an apostolic tradition. What apostle gave us the, the canon? What apostle handed this down? You see, once you start getting into specifics, I remember I, I asked Father Mitchell Paquil once, uh, has Rome defined a single word that Jesus or any apostle ever said, de fide, that exists outside of Scripture? And he said, I can't think of a word. And so... Again, it comes down to when you when you ask the question, what is the ultimate authority? It's what God says. And what has Rome done when she's denied that? Today, Peter must believe to be... And you see, one of the reasons you mentioned at the beginning about the possibility of a division between us on this basis, mm -hmm. you know what? To be honest with you, that exists because I take very seriously Rome's own teachings. And a lot of the ecumenism of today just simply... Courses over it. it. It just says eh, doesn't doesn't really matter. Let's mm. just let's just not worry about those oh, things. Yeah. And I, I don't think that's I don't even think that's respectful. Let alone I really honoring uh, the truth that we say that we that we that we possess. Amen. So when it comes to issues of defining what Peter must believe today, de fide, I think Peter would have a problem with anyone who claims to be a faithful believing Roman Catholic that does not believe <laughs> what Rome has defined on the basis of tradition, specifically mm. the Immaculate Conception, the bodily yeah. assumption of Mary. Absolutely. Um, I mean, the <laughs> words that Rome has used to define these things are unequivocal. I mean, they're just as, as plain mm. as, as day, and yet you wouldn't believe what I hear. Maybe, well, you hear it over here, but in the United States you get the same thing. I run into Roman Catholics that just bend the <laughs> parameters of language to just push these things back into the realm of mythology and something they don't really have to mm -hmm. believe. Mm -hmm. And Rome has said, this is what we teach, this you must mm -hmm. believe, mm -hmm. without any question. Well, where does that come from? I say, there is not a single apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, when we come to the bodily assumption, obviously, some of them would have died bef before those events, so we can't even go there. But if the issue is, these are apostolic traditions, I dispute, I argue, uh, that there is any evidence whatsoever that any apostle of Jesus Christ ever taught anything even remotely similar to what Rome has defined on the basis of tradition. And so how can, you know, let's say Rome has taught these things. How do we test it? How do we test? Yeah. That, that rather those presupposes Sola Scriptura, surely. Um, because you're assuming that the only source for all the theological data that we have that forms the deposit of faith is scripture alone. And actually, you know, you would be the first to, going back to what you just said earlier, you would be the first uh, to say that Jesus didn't reject traditions per se. He rejected those traditions which were contrary to the scriptures. Yes. He rejected those traditions which were contrary to the, the righteous practice of the law mm -hmm. because they were, in, it, the Pharisees were completely inconsistent. But Traditions themselves are not bad things. You've, you've said that many times. It's a, it's a key uh, a confusion people have about Protestant doctrines. It's not that they reject tradition. It's that they reject traditions that they believe are counter-biblical or unbiblical. But I don't or the think... elevation of tradition to having an authority that mm. is equal to mm. Scripture. Mm. For example, the Corban rule, mm. which the Jews had elevated to that, mm. that point. And Jesus said, I don't care mm. if you think it came from Moses. That's not relevant. It goes against what Scripture is. So but there's, clearly, a, there's an authority. Clearly, the, the canon was something which was accepted as essentially something which was passed down right to them today. 
that there's no other way you can explain the, the existence of the canon or an idea that they had certain books that they, re they actually did accept. I mean, obviously, there was disagreement amongst the Jews. For example, the Sadducees only accepted, uh, was it so? Yeah, they only accepted the Torah. Whereas the, the Pharisees accepted a wider canon, and there's, there's, there's disagreement over that. Some disagreement over that. There's yeah. obviously the, the Septuagint versus the Tanakh, and yeah, you've got all sorts of disagreements around that. So I don't need to actually believe that the Jews had an absolute infallible understanding of the canon. I don't need to believe that. I don't need to have but they had a sufficient understanding of the canon to be held accountable yeah. by the Lord Jesus yeah. for that. So there was sufficient tradition for them to be able to say, look, this was given to us from our forebears, from our forefathers. I don't need to say they had a developed theology of the magisterium and this, that, and the other. But I can say now, how do we as Christians know that all the books of the New Testament are the books of the New Testament? We don't know it through Scripture alone. And you haven't except, given me except, anywhere in Scripture. Except the problem there is that the tradition that you are identifying as the Jewish source of their canon is opposite that which Rome has now defined as being in Well, I don't yet, agree with that. Uh, well, I don't agree with that at all. Well, I, I, think, I, I, think, I, I think I can demonstrate gonna, that I don't think clearly, we can. I don't but, think we can get into a discussion about the, the deuterocanonical text without detracting from the ultimate authority mm -hmm. issue. But, look, I don't need yeah. to believe that there is this, uh, say, this Jewish magisterium. And, and actually, you know, the nature of... Um, the nature of theonicity, the fact that, G that the, the Holy Scriptures are theonicist, simply tells us the means by which this particular God's speaking happened. God also speaks in different ways. For example, um, Jesus says to um, the apostles that there are many other things I would like to tell you, and I shall, the Spirit of Truth will lead you into them. And when in one of the letters of John, John says, you know, that those who hear us hear God. Those who do not hear us reject God. And this is how you know the spirit of truth and error. Not by going to the scriptures, by hearing the apostles and their teaching. It's the church, in fact, consistently, inspired by the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, which is consistently given this kind of authority. So, so well, to be, it's not scripture that. alone. Well, right. well, let me contrast Go that with then, what, yes. what Paul himself said. When Paul writes to Timothy, he says, difficult times are coming, there's going to be apostasy, there's going to be those opposing the truth. What does he say? But you, in opposition to them, you continue in the things you have learned, become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. See, God does use means. Mm -hmm. It's sort of been presented as if sola scriptura means there are no means. That's, that's not the case at all. And that from childhood you have known what? Uh, the, the ecstatic utterances of people or something like that? No. The sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus, which then leads us into that classical text where Paul says all scripture is theanustos and therefore it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training righteousness. And here's the, here's the <laughs> issue. So that the man of God may be fully equipped Fully equipped. Now, so here's here's a question I've asked for many many years. I know that Peter's just just chomping at the bit to answer it. <laughs> if the dogmas of Rome, in regards to the infallibility of the Pope, in regards to the immaculate conception of Mary, in regards to uh, the the uh, bodily assumption of Mary, which which I can I can show you where popes taught against those things mm -hmm. in history. Um, if those are now a part of the gospel, and I guess I need to actually ask Peter at this point, because again, there's different perspectives, but uh, I've done debates with people who have actually said that we have the same epistemological warrant for believing in the bodily assumption of Mary as we have for believing in the resurrection of Jesus Just for those who Christ. aren't familiar, and you're obviously both very familiar with what the bodily assumption of Mary is, mm -hmm. can you just explain, James, what don't that... You, don't you bit, think he's the one... Who, don't you, all right. I, why don't we let... I don't even... I'm, I'm I think Peter, I could give Peter, you an accurate, okay. uh, I'm an sure accurate James definition. I'm, I'm sure James White could do it. Okay, yeah, but yeah, because cool. this is um, kind of where the, the rubber hits the road, because yeah. a lot of Protestants listening to this show may think, mm. oh, I probably don't differ from Peter that much in my basic beliefs. Mm -hmm. But, Peter, you believe that Mary was bodily assumed into heaven mm -hmm. she did not die that's not well, part of no 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 okay, that's like we're agnostic about that that's <laughs> okay. exactly why that's i thought a, we would right, have no okay, problem right, <laughs> because, oh, no, 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 that's actually not defined that's no. actually allowed all right okay. the, the, but, but this obviously the forms no part of the average protestants kind of Absolutely. makeup of beliefs Absolutely. about about scripture and in, and it's not found in scripture obviously mm -hmm. so 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 why do you believe that particular view of Mary and why do you hold it as oh, grief no, as, that that's going to lead us down a whole different okay. uh, debate into <laughs> maybe, Mariology maybe a bit, the yeah. thing is if you're going to debate Mariology you have to build from the base up you can't just simply go right there's a proof text for for the you know uh, assumption of Mary you can't do that you have to say look what does scripture say about Mary what do the early Christians say about Mary and why therefore has this teaching developed over time because I'm perfectly happy to admit it developed over time I'm perfectly happy to admit that until 1950 was it four I can't remember 50. Why. 50, yes, no, you're quite right. 1854 for Immaculate Conception. For the Gaps Conception. That's why right. I, I, I and can the use them all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so 1950, we don't, until that point, we don't infallibly define that this is an, a truth that you must believe. I'm perfectly, <clears throat> sorry, perfectly happy to, to say that because mm -hmm. actually what happens 
with the church is that it slowly but surely comes into more and more and more truth, more deepening of truth. All of that truth is consistent with what went before in terms of what it is actually defined, whether through the ordinary magisterium or the extraordinary magisterium. But it's something which deepens through theological thinking, through you know, the experience of the church, through all sorts of different things. So the church over time has built up more and more and more certainty about what is the deposit of faith. So it doesn't need to have the, this total consistent, right, there's the deposit of faith right through. Mm. Uh, it develops that over time. And, of course, our deepening, our theological deepening, you know, something you can illustrate by looking at the doctrine of the Trinity. In terms of the language we use the Council of Nicaea, those aren't things, I think, that we would have used. Term, terminology like um, mm. uh, homoousios, these are not things we would have necessarily used before. Those are terminologies that we use afterwards because of the development and deepening of thought of, well, how does this thing called the Trinity work? I mean, even the word Trinity isn't used. But the basic core truth of the Trinity, that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is always believed by and, Christians. And defended strongly by James. Absolutely. <laughs> but, but you you won't find it defending the like godly assumption of no, Mary. No, and, and say, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. I like Peter, and that's why I'm not quite as upset now as I normally am when I see <laughs> the divine biblical doctrine of the Trinity being parallel to something that no apostle ever said a word about. Mm -hmm. In fact, nobody for 500 years. In fact, the first time this dogma even, or this belief even appears in church history, it's being preached against by the Bishop of Rome, for crying out loud. So, I mean, when you, when you mm -hmm. really look at it, this to me... Uh, you cannot begin to understand the New Testament and what it says about the gospel outside of the doctrine of the Trinity. It makes no sense. That guy Jesus is saying things that no mere human could ever say. But you can read the entirety of the New Testament as Augustine did, as Athanasius did, as Tertullian did, mm -hmm. without ever thinking about the bodily assumption of Mary and have no problems at all. And yet today, Peter says dogmatically, to be right with the church, you must believe this. Mm. And this is why you must believe because in Sola Scriptura. Because this spirit, is what it is. Because the spirit of truth leads the church into all truth eventually. I, and we still haven't heard why, for but there's example, no the tradition. The there's scriptures. no tradition for this. This is the problem. <laughs> if you want to talk about church plus scripture plus tradition, mm -hmm. here is where for many people, the, 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 the triumvirate falls apart because the reality is what Rome has defined as dogma is not a part of tradition. I mean, I've, I've debated some of the best on the subject of the papacy. And if you look at the, the, the papacy, the infallibility of the Pope, and those last two Marian dogmas, because these are all mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, modern exemplar, exemplars. Post-biblical mm -hmm. things. Very post-biblical things that have become de fide. When you look at those things, that's when you get the real sense of what happens once you knock the walls of Scripture down and say, there's more out there. We can, by the Spirit, interpret these things. And it's funny, I, I appreciate, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can put you in a tough position here, Peter, <laughs> because in the States, the big argument against Sola Scripture, and it's funny, you said, well, let's get back to canon, it's funny. You say, well, there's too much to talk about the Marian dogmas. Well, well there's too much to talk about the Marian dogmas. And for the topic. Protestant, there's too much to talk about on the canon, even though Roman Catholics always go there first, without actually, I think, providing a basis for why their authority somehow works there. But the big argument in the United States against Sola Scriptura, it goes like this. There's... Um, the number keeps expanding, 38,000 mm -hmm. Protestant mm -hmm. denominations, mm -hmm. and it's all because of Sola Scriptura. Now, that number happens to be utterly and completely bogus, uh, because when you actually look at the sources, they're including people like um, African Gnostics, uh, all the various Mormon groups. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm sorry, sure. when you start saying the sure. Mormons are Jehovah's Witnesses <laughs> due to Sola Scriptura, you've missed something along the line. Oh, I agree. But the argument is Sola Scriptura leads to this form of anarchy. And I would like to point out that that misses something very fundamental. I'm saying when you look at, when you look, if, if you brought an Orthodox Presbyterian in here and you brought a conservative Anglican in here and you brought people who actually believe in Sola Scriptura, our differences would be minuscule in comparison if you brought people in here who say, oh, I accept the Bible plus mm -hmm. what the Spirit tells me over here. You're, those people aren't going to be able to agree on who God is. So the so I can I can the, the amongst the people who try to who know what sola scriptura is and try to practice it, 
the range of belief is incredibly narrow okay. as a result. I see what you're saying. There is mm. so much which has just been said to deal with. My goodness. I mean, we've gone from <laughs> Mariology to 2 Timothy 3 to the, the, the explosion. And I didn't even finish domination. asking my question. I mean, <laughs> remind me to ask that question. <laughs> it's, I haven't, it's, this is the problem just one hour. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'm not going to try to deal with Mariology because it's a huge subject, and I would love to debate that, however, with, with you some other time. Oh, we because had a lot we of need, success because because we need the debate uh, for this <laughs> subject. I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, sure. need to, we need to work harder at that. But, uh, so I will deal with two things, because I can only choose to do a few okay, things. Go ahead. I can only choose to do, uh, so because you just raised it and you tried to put me in a difficult position, uh, the 38,000, yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy to admit the 38,000, or whatever it is now, because uh, it keeps on going up and down. It was an, I'm uh, so old, it was know, the 20s when it started. Right, well, there you go. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm quite happy to say, okay, that's, an, that's you know, counting all these groups that shouldn't be counted, but let's say it's just 500. Would that make your position any better? You know, if it's, if it's even just 500 denominations, we know it's more than 500 denominations, though, that would be a problem. But this is my problem with this argument, right? I don't ha actually have a problem with Catholics and Protestants on this, pro on this whole argument. Because partly, <clears throat> the reason why there's an explosion of different Protestant sects and denominations is not so much Sol Scriptura, because a lot of these denominations believe pretty much exactly the same thing. I mean, they're mostly, or a lot of them are, different f sort of flavours of charismatic evangelical Protestantism. And which a lot have, of them, not really, not even Sol Scriptura is. Yeah, I mean, and a Credo Baptist and have the same kind of practice that they've basically taken from someone else and so there's not a great deal of, of theological difference actually the problem with denominations is not protestant epistemology it's protestant ecclesiology in other words because there is this whole idea of well you know i can set up my own denomination man and that's perfectly valid I and agree. that that's why it happens I and agree. actually there are a lot of protestants who would say well, most so, why most, not most which is why you get reformed exactly. baptists uh, exactly, right. exactly. You're, you know one little church and <laughs> you know so that's why that happens more than i think protestant epistemology it is however interesting that uh, and this is why i think Sol Scripture has a little bit of uh, reason for that is because people are ba basically feel they can in interpret the Bible as they see fit. Yep. They don't have an exterior authority to which they are. Hang on, mm -hmm. to which <laughs> they are. To which, to, which, to which they are. To which they are essentially. Um, Bound, yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. I mean, the, the fact that, for example, before the Reformation, there are essentially three schisms, just three, over 1,500 years, three schisms. You've got the uh, you count the Assyrian Church of the East breaking off in 431 AD, you've got the Oriental Orthodox breaking away in 451 AD, and then you've got the uh, schism between the West and the East uh, in 1054. And th Don't those, tell the those are the ones, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. They, they would not appreciate being ignored. Though. Yeah, I know, but they're, they're, they're something, I mean, we wouldn't call necessarily Oriental Orthodox Syrian Church of the East heretics, but don't insist. But well. the point um, is, but the, the we we managed to basically keep to fairly united exactly. for a long time, for a very, very, very under, long time under Catholic view of Scripture. Because, because there was this purveying view p that, that kept on going of Scripture tradition and the magisterium of the Church, and the Church was something which was actually quite important. Being members of the Church was seen as something which is, and still is today, necessary for salvation. So th this is something which, that's the reason why that explosion happens. It's partly because of Protestant ecclesiology, and it's partly because of a particular epistemology, soul scripture, which basically allows people, enables this kind of chaos to happen. Now, I'm I, I have to disagree with what Justin well, just said. I don't okay. give, I don't we'll we'll let you come back in a moment, James. I don't give that entirely sole scripture, but I think there's a balance that okay. needs to Your be made. Your second here. point. The second point, 2 Timothy 3, I don't think proves the case. Um, partly because it says, Pasoglyphia Theonis is Kaya Thelemos, or Thelemos. It is useful. It is useful for what? For teaching, correction, rebuking, and training in righteousness. And it's those things that make you complete and fully equipped for every kind of good work. In other words, it's being taught, it's being corrected, it's being rebuked, and it's trained in righteousness. Those are the things that make you complete and fully equipped. And Scripture's relationship to that is what? Useful. It's useful. It's off elemos. It's profitable. Not only that, but I actually think that the Panergon Agathon, the, 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 all these good works, to try to shoehorn in all the necessary data that you need, all the, the scripture sufficient for all the necessary and essential truths of the deposit of faith, to say that it gives you the ability to do all good works, to shoehorn those, that concept into the other, I think is deeply okay, suggestive. So you because feel it's, clear it's a, bit of a, beginning, a bit of a twisting of that scripture yeah, to, and, and to two, Timothy create two, a doctrine. It, it, it does talk about... Um, I can get up the scriptures. The problem with using an iPad rather than an actual <laughs> Bible. Um, Other tablets are available. Yes, yes, you're quite right. <laughs> if any man therefore shall cleanse himself from these things, from these uh, unworthy things, he shall be a vessel unto honour, sanctified and profitable for the Lord, prepared unto every good work. He's talking about works of moral righteousness, clearly, to the things that you ought to be doing as a good bishop, because he's handing the, the reins on to Timothy. So I don't think, for all those different reasons, that 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 is sufficient, argue, uh, really, to give us soul scripture. Okay. And if actually Scholes of Trio can't even be derived from the Bible, my goodness, what does that tell us? All right, James, you've a few things you wanted well, to come uh, with. I, I said something wrong as well. There, well, so. yeah, you, you uh, pr uh, allowed a default view uh, of everyone holding a quote-unquote Catholic view of Scripture during all of church history. Sure. And I would 
strongly disagree with that. I mean, uh, when you look at how Athanasius uh, argued for the, the deity of Christ, Athanasius is the perfect example of the fact that that was not the view at the time. Uh, Nicaea was not viewed as an ecumenical council. It had to fight for itself. Augustine, when he was quoting, uh, when he was arguing with an Arian, said, "You must not quote the authority of Ariminum against me, and I must not quote the authority of Nicaea against you. We must go to the God-breathed scriptures." Mm -hmm. So Augustine recognized you had councils that had contradicted one another, and Athanasius is kicked out of his church five times. And is told by the entire church, even the Bishop of Rome had collapsed on this. He's, it's Athanasius contra mundum. There's, there's no, there's no. I think there's very good, good no, evidence of that. Even no, Jerome, even, even Jerome recognized that that was the case. The point is he's standing against councils that had more bishops in it than Nicaea ever had. And he said, no, the scriptures teach this. And he held to it. Mm. And we are thankful that he held to it today. So I have to dispute the idea. But that because and especially, and especially because especially I was, an ecclesial but, I, but, but I was but I was disagreeing with with the uh, the assertion that well for two thousand years they had had this view I would say that that was not the view that was held by many many people there was not one it was primarily the central organizing factor of the papacy and an external authority not the view of, yet, of scripture yet but, doesn't Peter's point still stand that there was compared to since the Reformation, where there's been a kind of proliferation of denominations, there were relatively few split, splits for 1,500 well, years. Well, when you say splits, I have a hard time thinking that the lesbian female professor at Boston College teaching Catholic history mm. and this fellow are actually together just <laughs> oh, because they're in the Roman <laughs> communion. Agree. So, so well, she's I, not because she's essentially excommunicated herself by being a heretic and by being a, a and when, sinner. And when um, Rome gets around to doing that officially, I'll, you know <laughs> then I'll listen to do what you, she do, has to do, say. Do you know what? Then, that is a point I will absolutely grant to Dr. White because the, the Catholic Church is not impeccable. It's not always perfect in its practice. And I agree. There are people... I don't. I have no idea why Hans Kung is not excommunicated. Uh, I have no earthly idea. I've asked a member of the CDF, why have you not excommunicated this guy? CDF said, being oh, the... Oh, sorry, the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, which is the body responsible for d doing for things like this, for, okay. for adoctrinal orthodoxy okay. and for doing this kind of stuff. The modern, uh, the modern incarnation of the, of the Inquisition, actually. As, as people always <laughs> like to remind us. Um, but I, of I course, there were Protestant Inquisitions, too. Okay. But nonetheless, uh, the point is, yes, you, absolutely. You, you agree with James. I totally and agree. The, the there church are, there needs people to, to get its act absolutely. together. But do you know what? Just after the Pope okay. said, you know, this whole thing about the interview with the Pope recently, and he's like, oh, he's liberalising on abortion, homosexuality. Sexuality. What did he do straight afterwards? He excommunicated an Australian priest who advocates for a liberalisation of the views on homosexuality and other things because of uh, partly his disobedience and partly because he gave uh, he had a, a, a blasphemous Eucharist where he gave the Eucharist to a dog. Uh, the church is not afraid to, always okay. to, to crack down on this, and this Pope isn't the liberal that people imagine him but to you, be. But you hadn't quite um, finished your, your I, point. I'll be honest with you, I don't know where he is yet. Uh, give us a year, we might have a better idea. I mean, I think you got to admit, it's, but pretty, it's, it's mm -hmm. been pretty interesting so far. But mm. just in response, to the second Timothy, when you look at the, con the context, there wasn't any context given there in, in that in that exegesis. I'll be perfectly honest with you, because what Paul is saying is, in light of these false teachers who are coming, what's going to be your basis for doing teaching, reproof, correction? And the question I was going to ask, and and Peter knows this, and, and he anticipated it, is if these if the teaching of the bodily assumption of Mary is a good work. And if that's a truth divine by God, which according to the Roman Catholic Church it is, then teaching it would be a good work. How does Scripture make you capable, make you able to do that? And I think the only answer is, well, you know, it teaches you to be a faithful son of the church or something like that. That's not what Paul was saying to Timothy. Timothy he was saying to Timothy, Timothy, you're going to have an unchanging source and standard to be able to go to here. And you've always known what it is. You're not going to have to be looking to something else. You're not going to have to be looking to someone else. There, we don't have to look to Salt Lake City. And we don't have to work, wait until 1830 when Joseph Smith comes along. We're not going to have to look to New York and Brooklyn and the faithful and discreet slave or any of the rest of this type of stuff because God has spoken in his word and it's absolutely... But even as I he was writing that letter, saying, P would Paul have known that what he was writing down at that moment would become canon that's scripture? A, that's assuming that it's Paul's intention here when he talks about scripture to define the canon of scripture. The point is, if it is theonustos, it is authoritative. The issue is not, well, do we have something that's less than theonustos that's going to be authoritative or anything else? He's saying to Timothy, you know what to look to. You have this, uh, this authority. And when we take what 
and, and name the group. You see, it, it, you know, Peter's sitting here now, so we I have to keep talking about, well, what has Rome defined on this basis? We could be talking about soteriological issues. There's mm-hmm. issues about uh, priesthood, mass, uh, justification. Yeah. There's all I'll sorts of things that we have to get in, get into that stuff. Yeah. But if, but if, if, if there was, if there was a representative of the Mormon Church here. It would be a different set of things I'd be talking about, but I'd be coming back to the exact same standard. If it's a Jehovah's Witness, you've we've sat here well, and uh, we've had uh, Abdullah uh, on the Lucy sitting there, and what have I come back to? Yeah. The exact same standard. I, I, we, we are going to have to go to a break, sure. um, uh, and then I'll let you right. come okay. back, Peter. Okay. Otherwise, we'll, we'll be going over time. But but yeah, a really um, interesting to and fro on the program today, as you mm-hmm. can hear between my two guests joining me today for Unbelievable, Peter D. Williams of the Catholic Church uh, and James White representing a protestant reformed tradition um and uh, we're talking today about the ultimate authority for christians is it sola scriptura scripture alone or is it scripture plus church tradition and the teaching of the catholic church well that's certainly the view of peter d williams and opposite him on this is james white of alpha and omega ministries uh, come back as we just finish off today's program in just a moment's time you're listening to unbelievable with me justin Briley. Welcome back to Unbelievable this Saturday afternoon with me, Justin Briley, uh, the talking shop for Christians. Uh, back to my guests on today's program as we finish up the discussion in a moment, Peter D. Williams and James White. Uh, you're listening to the Faith Explored afternoon of programming here on Premier. And straight after Unbelievable, we've got the profile interview. Uh, today's guests are John and Ellie Mumford talking to Lucinda Vanderhart about being leaders of the Vineyard Church in the UK. They've got a famous son, too none other than marcus mumford the lead singer of mumford and sons well they're not in to actually talk about that they're talking about how they established the vineyard church having come under the influence of a famed u.s charismatic john wimber in the 1980s fascinating interview between four and five this afternoon stay tuned to premier to hear that straight after this program next week on unbelievable uh, we're going to have a debate well I'm not sure exactly which one it'll be at the moment possibly we might be lining up a debate with the latest person with their theory about Jesus. Joseph Atwill has been in the news recently claiming that Jesus was an invention of the Roman authorities. Still uh, looking at the possibilities around that. Might be that we get something on air next week for that. If it's not that, then we've got a fascinating discussion to play out between humanist celebrant Hannah Hart and Christian church leader Faith Forster on rites of passage. How a church leader, a Christian and an atheist might mark those rituals of births, deaths and weddings and so on and why we want to find meaning in these milestones of life so one of two possible discussions uh, on your headset uh, on your radio next week do hope you can come back for those here on unbelievable let's conclude today's discussion you're listening to unbelievable on premier christian radio and so concluding our discussion uh, between a Catholic and Protestant guest today, we've been asking what is the ultimate authority for Christians? Is it scripture alone or scripture plus sacred t- t- tradition and the teaching of the Catholic Church? Uh, two very knowledgeable, um, very good debaters as well with me today. Um, they are James White of Alpha and Omega Ministries, aomin.org if you want to check out his website. Uh, does podcasts, blogs, uh, debates, loads of stuff, writes books by the bucketful. Uh, you can find him there, uh, aomin.org. Peter D. Williams, uh, who is a writer and speaker and one of the representatives for Catholic Voices, um, is also online at catholicvoices.org.uk. Again, um, loads and loads of resources from them and from Peter if you want to look them out. Um, we've had such a kind of feisty, um, well-argued debate today, gentlemen. Um, you both know what you're talking about, that's for sure. Um, and so much more that could be said. We've glossed over the, the, the surface of many issues. You know, I'd, I want to do a program on the Assumption of Mary now, but who yeah. knows where... where Mariology in general. Because, Mariology yeah. in general, yes. T- high time we did something like that. Okay, but Peter, um, I think James had the last sort of... Uh, well, the, the, the last thing we heard was that um, essentially the difference between all these different groups is that they don't take scripture alone. I actually disagree. I think the difference between all these groups is that they basically make themselves the authority over scripture. And I think that's exactly what Dr. White and other people do. I mean, actually, I don't think that um, functionally, uh, if we're going to go by, well, the church defines what the scriptures are and the church uh, interprets the scriptures. Well, I, in, fa- in that case, if we're going by that kind of functionality. I don't think Dr. White believes in sola scripture any more than I do. I think he believes in sola alba, 
white alone. He defines what the scriptures are, he defines what the scriptures say, because he's the interpreter. He's the one who decides historically what these things are. And it would be fair to say, if I can just come in here, James, for instance, when you say, well, I could probably agree on loads of stuff with someone else who's sola scriptura, but you might differ with a Presbyterian who's sola scriptura on pedo-baptism those kinds of issues. So, yeah. Well, let's so, go about something more important. Okay. I mean, something like baptism regeneration. But Lutherans we, believe in baptism re- regeneration. That matters. That's something we, on which, on, in fact, Dr. White would point to us Catholics and say, oh, that's terrible. Um, you're putting something other than faith as a means of salvation, you know. Um, that's a pretty important issue. I mean, the Calvinist debate, uh, which you often engage in, you say, this is this is pretty basic stuff you, to Arminians. To, most this, certainly. But, yeah. but what do we go to? What do, when I have debated my Presbyterian brothers on this, uh, Bill Shishko, pastor of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Franklin Square, uh, New York. We debated this issue, and we debated it very forcefully. But we debated it in collegiality. We had the same source to go to. Mm-hmm. We stand together on the gospel. We stand together on justification. We stand together on the Trinity. Um, he could go with me uh, into a mosque, and we would have the same message to people as mm-hmm. to, and that's where the difference is. If someone walked up to Bill Shishko and I, outside of an abortion clinic and said, mm. What's, what must I do to be saved? We'd mm. have the same answer. Mm. The tragedy, and I do view it as a tragedy, is that if someone asks Peter and I, we're not going to answer in the same way. And that has to be admitted because half the problem that I see today in the Catholic Protestant discussion is that we've decided that doesn't matter anymore. I and, agree. And, and, it, and it, doesn't, it doesn't make a lick of sense to me. Mm. That's, that's really demonstrating that neither one of us really believe that the gospel's definitional anymore. And as long as the book of Galatians is in the New Testament, I'm going to have to be a stick in the mud. I'm going to have to be your radical, mean-spirited uh, American <laughs> Calvinist guest on, on Unbelievable. Um, because it seems to me there's this mere Christianity thing going around that says as long as you believe in the Trinity mm-hmm. and the crucifixion of Jesus and resurrection, mm. that's pretty much it. Mm. You don't need anything more. Mm. Now, now, you've heard me criticize this, mm. uh, Justin, a yeah, few times. Yeah. There's a book of Galatians. And there's no evidence that I can see in the book of Galatians that the Judaizers were denying any of those things. He doesn't fault them for any of those things. Instead, what he says is, fault, brethren, had crept in trying to k- take us captive. And Paul says the truth of the gospel was at stake there. Mm. For me, it seems that the gospel is definitional of what the Christian church actually is. Mm. And if you don't have the gospel, you're not representing Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, if anyone's embarrassed of me and what? My gospel. I'll be embarrassed of him. And so I'm, I know that I'm completely outside the bounds anymore uh and and i don't get the invites to the big conferences as a result because you're just one of those i'm forced to it you know it was just said you're uh, you're making yourself the authority of scripture if you do not engage in meaningful exegesis of the text you will have to do that i reject however that i am doing that because i do come to the text and i want to know what the text actually says so that i know what the author was saying Mm. Uh, that's the ma- that's but the that's way you it. do that. Well, everyone, everyone would say that. Everyone would say, "Well, I'm just taking what the Bible says," including the people with whom you have much more di- deep disagreements than pedo Baptists, because that's not really a very important issue compared to, as I say, baptism regeneration or the nature of justification or, or, or other such things. And the thing is, what we would say is, we're recognizing what Scripture says and we're recognizing what sacred tradition says as well. We all claim to have this passive role. Saying but the difference is, but the diff- well, very true. But the difference is, you make yourself the arbiter because you are using your own human reason to exegete the Scripture. So ultimately, your own human reason, your own human subjectivity becomes the magisterium, whether you, you want to admit and it or not. And of course, epistemologically, and I point out to every Roman Catholic, you have made a decision to follow the claims of the Bishop of Rome rather than the prophet in Salt Lake City, rather than the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, rather than these people over there. That was a fallible decision on your part. Yeah, you are not absolutely. infallible in making that decision. So, so to try to say, well, so I have, I have <laughs> I'm not using my fallible uh, nature I say, yes, you are, because you may say, okay, and I've, ma- I've made my choice, and I'm just going to go with whatever the Pope says. I say, you have to be able to examine what the Pope says. You have to be able to examine what sure. the Church says. You're, you're different in the, the same boat in that The sense. difference is, is that what you're doing is you're using your fellow human reason to discern doctrine outside of the context of, I mean, you don't, not so you don't, have to, you don't have to ignore these things, but outside the context of the sacred tradition magisterium, whereas I'm using my fellow human reason to simply say, I recognize by history that these are reasonable sources. Those no, are two distinct it, it, different roles. You're discerning that doctrine. I'm simply recognizing what the authority is. But here's are. a misrepresentation of Sola Scriptura. Human reason okay. in here's here's a misrepresentation of Sola Scriptura, however. I know church history. I teach church history. I'll be teaching church history in Kiev in February. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I do not interpret the Bible outside of a recognition of how it's been interpreted in the past. I just recognize that those who've interpreted it in the past, my goodness, read the patristic sources. Sometimes they face planted. Oh, I agree. Sometimes they had agree. they had traditions that are just so far out in the woods it's not even funny. And just like we have some people that have that today. So it's but not a matter old, it's not me much, and my it's not me and my Bible under a tree alone. No. I stand on the shoulders of giants, but just because I stand on the giant's shoulders does not mean I invest the giant with infallibility. I can recognize that even in the heroes of the faith, look, Calvin would have had me drowned or burned or at least excommunicated, <laughs> one of them. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I obviously, I think the difference, honestly, Peter, in, in how we treat church history is I don't have to make the early church fathers anything other than what they were. Neither do I, actually. I don't have to believe everything they said was infallible either. But when, I simply recognize but when that when they Cognitum do... But when tells you that they universally believed something... They did. I mean, you, but absolutely all of them believed in, for example, baptism regeneration. I'm not, that's, uh, that's, not, that's not what Sas Cognitum was talking about. It was talking about the papacy, and it was talking about Matthew 16. And I look at that and I go, that's simply not true, and I can demonstrate that it's not true. But if Rome infallibly tells you it's true, can you honestly evaluate... Mm. Yeah. What Rome says infallibly and come to the conclusion that it's wrong. Yes, because then I would no longer be a Catholic. I would leave the Catholic Church if I believed that. Okay, there's, there's the difference. There's, <laughs> if, I, if, I I if I believe that, I actually, I <laughs> we, actually we, do we, think there is a consistency we, in the primacy of the papacy throughout time. We, we're going to have um, to come but, to sort of final conclusions now, James. Yeah. So, okay, what have we learned uh, in the course of today's show? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, um, it's just nursery school now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so what have we learned? <laughs> final thoughts from Jerry Springer. Um, no, uh, l- let's... Oh, it hasn't been that bad. No, it's not been that bad. There were no chairs <laughs> thrown across I the studio. Un- I listened to Unbelievable. I could point to a few programs that... Uh, <laughs> uh, um, no, fascinating. And um, as it stands, Peter, you you came back to the Catholic Church, having wandered away mm-hmm. for quite some time. Um, and so, some people might be surprised that you're willing to throw your, you know, throw everything into the these three areas mm-hmm. of, of tradition and t- uh, teaching and scripture, mm. which comes up with something some things that most protestants would be quite surprised mm. by like like the you know mariology and so mm. on um but for you you're you're absolutely certain that this is the best way of yeah. inheriting the correct formulation of mm. faith down the years well it's the only consistent and historical one um yeah as i say that ultimately we've seen that for example scripture itself cannot be defined from scripture alone there is a total incoherence within the idea of soul scripture which we haven't heard answered except by a, a difference without a distinction this whole idea of the artif- artifact object distinction doesn't work simply doesn't work because it's not about the nature of revelation or how revelation comes to be it's about how we know what is revelation and the only answer to that historically is scripture tradition recognized by the magisterial teaching authority of the church we've seen that very consistently and there's been no i've i've, I've looked Believe me, I've been researching this question for 10 years. I know that's nowhere near the number of years that Dr. White's been doing things. He's got a... I don't want to be you know, two decades old. But, you know, um, get out of that. Um, but, yeah, you know, ultimately, I've never found a proper answer to the canon question. And that, the reason I go back to that is because I think it best illustrates the difference between us. Based on the fact we need to have something other than Scripture to define what Scripture is, that's clearly a tradition and it's clearly recognised by the Church over time. And there are so many things we could have gone into which we haven't gone into, like Matthew sixteen eighteen. This is why this is frustrating. It's an hour's worth, yes. which you can only scratch the surface of. But ultimately, I think that's the only consistent way, and it's the only historic way. This is why there was such unity in the Church before the sixteenth okay. century. We'll, we, we we appreciate you coming on today, Peter, mm-hmm. to, to give you a perspective on this. James, a quick summing up from you. Well, very quickly, I think the can issue is a non-starter because it's circular uh, and, and the reality is when you look at the history of Rome's uh, ruminations on this subject uh, when you've got popes contradicting what you eventually come up with that's really uh, for ultimate authority that's uh, that's, a, that's a difficult thing for me the real issue is how do we know what is God's will well Jesus and the apostles gave us these things Rome has never given us a single word that Jesus and the apostles said outside of what's found in scripture and true apostolic succession in my opinion is walking in the footsteps of the apostles, not in some kind of torturous, circuitous line through history. And you cannot trace a single line through history. Just look at the Avignon papacy, look at the pornocracy. I mean, church history is is not a friend of that kind of claim. True apostolic succession is walking in the steps and teaching what they themselves taught. And when you look at what Rome is now teaching in in the guise of denial of sola scriptura, the bodily assumption, papal infallibility. These are things the apostles and their 
churches that they started never believed. This developed over time. There's reasons why it developed, but did not come okay. from the apostolic deposit. We are going to have to leave it there. So much more that could be said. Perhaps we'll get you both back for a, another round yeah. on, on a, one Sounds of these brilliant. specific issues at some point down the line. But thank you very much, gentlemen, both for being with me. Really interesting debate today. I wonder what you thought of it. Well, I'm going to be giving you the ways to get in touch in just a moment's time. But for the moment, uh, again, my thanks to Peter D. Williams. You can find out more about him at catholicvoices.org.uk and James White from Alpha and Omega Ministries. That's aomin.org. Gentlemen, thanks for being with me today. Thank great you. To Always great to be here. Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. So I always enjoy hearing what you thought of the program, and you can do that, of course, by tweeting me if you're on Twitter, at UnbelievableJB is my handle. You can find us on facebook.com slash unbelievablejb. Look forward to hearing from you that way. And, of course, the uh, the email is unbelievable at premier.org.uk. Got a number of those to read out in just a moment's time. Uh, you can also um, phone in, leave a voicemail comment, 08456 52 52 52, and select the option for the unbelievable voicemail service um, before we go to some of your comments on the last few weeks of programming and that's included um, great shows with uh, Lawrence Krauss and John Lennox and last week we had uh, David Beebe our atheist talking to Christian evangelist uh, Rice Brooks well got to uh, try to do a bit more of this actually um, just a few events coming up that you may be interested in, in if you're into apologetics in the UK uh, and if you've got an event that you'd like to tell me about more than happy to try and give it a mention on the show as well uh, firstly at the Hitching Christian Centre their their series on which Jesus continues uh, that's tomorrow Sunday the 13th of October between 7 and 9 p.m. it's going to be a discussion between Rabbi Nathan Levy and Dr. Brendan Devitt on Jewish perspectives on Jesus so that's happening at Hitch Hitchin Christian Centre, Bedford Road in Hitchin, uh, between 7 and 9 p.m. tomorrow, Sunday, the 13th of October. The Leicestershire Contenders Apologetics Group is having its first meeting on Saturday, the 19th of October, between 2 and 5 o'clock. Um, that's going to include Tom Price from the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics on equipping Christians to defend their faith, happening at Holy Trinity Church Lounge, Regent Road, Leicester. Uh, as I say, Saturday the 19th of October, if you're in the Leicestershire area, they've got a Facebook group. If you want to get more information, just look them up on Facebook. And finally, uh, the role of Christianity in education is going to be the subject of the Out of the Silent Church Conference in November. Uh, that's put together by the Solas Centre for Public Christianity, run, of course, by David Robertson, who's a regular guest on this programme. It's a day-long event. It's going to feature Sinclair Ferguson, David Robertson, Luke Bouzier and Mike Reeve speaking on education at home at school in the church and amongst the poor um, so it's got an apologetics edge to that conference uh, saturday the 23rd of november from 8 30 in the morning tickets are required go to the website find out more solus hyphen cpc dot org and we may well be getting um, a, a, a sort of debate on education going in a forthcoming program there's been some interesting stories just in the last couple of days the national secular society releasing a report claiming that uh, state schools are allowing fundamentalist christians creationism and so on into the classroom because of failures in re policies well um maybe we'll be able to do something about that before too long thanks to those who've been getting in touch um around various issues that have come up in recent programs just a quick shout out to louis rivera who says i live in the states chicagoland area been listening to unbelievable for a little over four and a half years i'm a huge fan i'd love it if you could get apologist evangelist donald j johnson on your show to dialogue with any atheist i think his approach is very refreshing he has his own podcast the don johnson show and a new book out how to talk to a skeptic which professor peter kraft happens to endorse just throwing it out there as a suggestion thank you louis i get many suggestions very hard to accommodate them all of course but uh, I do appreciate them when they come in and and uh, I do try to uh, action as many as possible. Uh, Marty Johnson is in Saskatchewan, Canada. I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I've got a few listeners there, not not least uh, Rebecca Benich, assuming she's still listening, who was a guest a few years ago on the programme, uh, an atheist guest. But uh, Marty is a Christian, says, I love your show. I listen to you when I'm both driving and exercising. You've become my unofficial exercise and driving buddy. 
However, I find you do most of the talking. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed your recent programme with Rice Brooks and David Beebe. Just to key you in on this, uh, Marty's talking about last week's programme. Atheist listener David Beebe came on for a discussion with church planter and apologist Rice Brooks. He's the author of a new book called God's Not Dead. So you say here, Marty, as a pastor in Canada, I differ with Beebe's conclusions on Jesus, but I found him as a debater very articulate and gracious to Brooks. I felt that Rice dodged Beebe's questions behind the reasoning of Brooks's support of a creator in light of the overwhelming evidence of fine-tuning, but wouldn't answer why he doesn't apply the same confidence towards evolution in light of its overwhelming support by the majority of scientific academics. As someone who's very open to the idea of theistic evolution, I would have preferred Rice to be more genuine about studies on this subject. Thanks, you rock! says marty thank you very much marty glad to have you on board listening um here's james who says i can't tell you how much i enjoy your show well, lots of compliments this week on the emails thank you very much uh you say much like david Beebe, i'm an atheist who's fascinated by religion and find your show refreshing and informative i listened to the last podcast and found rice brooks's bias lens argument both very telling and quite aggravating a theist scientist will come to every proposition with the same end game in mind god did it an atheist agnostic scientist if they're honest will not come to the proposition saying there will be no way this will point to god they can only say if this points to god or some non-material answer i will have to have more evidence to support it that's not to say that the atheist scientist is without any bias but he she is definitely not compelled to find a specific answer that satisfies an existential need for an all-loving being that will save his soul Put another way, if the fate of my child's life or soul depended on me making 2 plus 2 equals 5, I would work ceaselessly to do so, no matter the evidence against it. In fact, I would feel I had no choice. But if I have so grand at stake, my child, my life, my soul's salvation, then I think I would be more apt at finding an objective truth. Again, love the show all the way out here in Maryland, just outside Washington, D.C. Keep up the good work. And you hopefully just give a little description of, of your background. I'm a 39-year-old African-American male raised without religion, very odd for my community, and married a lapsed Baptist who's now a weak deist. Uh, thank you very much. Um, good to hear from you. Uh, appreciate you getting in touch, James. Uh, as you say, that in the end, if an atheist agnostic scientist is willing to follow the evidence wherever it leads then that is a, a measure of, of absolute honesty on their part and I would hope that a theist scientist would, would who's honest would, would also do the same um, but um, I, I just get the feeling though that some not all but some atheist scientists do come with that proposition that you mentioned there there will be no way this will point to God because they've sort of ruled God out a priori in some way anyway um richard says last week's show was heavy on evolution i heard it asked but i didn't hear an answer how did organic life spring forth from inorganic matter the message of genesis 1 and 2 is that god created it how he created it is outside the scope of the message being conveyed i don't believe in theistic evolution i'm okay with people who do as long as we focus on the central message god created it all of the arguments, Kalam, fine-tuning, evolution and so on, need to be grouped as a whole, not as individual pieces. If it's plausible for a god to create the universe, fine-tune it, create life and so on, wouldn't that same god have the power to raise Jesus from the dead? Tom Wilson uh, wants to weigh in on this. i um, guessing you're writing from a sceptical position here, Tom, judging by the email. You say, um, why does your author today, Rice Brooks, only allow two options? Either the world came from nothing or God started it. He clearly believes that God had no beginning. Why is it such a leap for me to believe that the universe had no beginning and will have no end? He also states without God there is no purpose. Well, I believe my purpose is to assist mankind as part of that community. Believing in God and that he has a purpose for us is also fraught with problems. And finally you say, why did he choose the Jews? god uh, you're talking about here a small tribe amongst the communities across the world why is he condemning millions of hindus muslims buddhists etc to hell when he chose to communicate through a small tribe and a badly written book asks tom uh, well all interesting questions which there are of course um, those who have given answers for and i won't attempt to give a sort of a, a defense at this point tom um, but i would obviously uh, encourage you to, to look back in past programs where we've dealt with similar kinds of issues um though saying i believe my purpose is to assist mankind as part of that community i i great gl glad that is your purpose um i suppose the, the bigger question that rice and others ask on that subject is well that's great to have that purpose but but does it stem from anywhere is it just something you've 
sort of made up if we are living actually in a universe that ultimately has a purpose um are, are these not just very subjective um sort of purposes that will eventually just dissolve into nothing in the end um uh let's go for one more and moving on to something else let's talk about uh uh, Norway, Matthias from Norway here says, I've been listening to Unbelievable for the last several months, going back and forth. My favourite programme so far is the justification debate between James White and N.T. Wright, but also the Young Earth creation debates were fisty and fun. One debate I really want to hear is Hugh Ross versus Lawrence Krauss, since it seems both of them know their physics, but still disagree to a great extent. I'm recommending different programmes to different friends of mine to get them thinking about their position, either they're believers or not. So keep up the good work. And you make a suggestion about doing a program on the Hebrew roots movement, um, which sounds very interesting. Uh, and I will certainly again give that consideration to Matthias. Thank you very much for listening over in Norway. Thank you wherever you're listening in the world, whether here in the UK via Premier Christian Radio or somewhere around the world via the podcast. Uh, it's great to have you on board for Unbelievable. Uh, exciting stuff coming up as well um, in the rest of this year and, and into next year. Um, lots of programmes in the offing. Uh, don't forget that following directly on from today's programme between four and five, you can hear Lucinda Vanderhart talking to John and Ellie Mumford, founders of the UK Vineyard Church. Not about their famous son, Marcus Mumford, uh, lead singer of Mumford and Sons. No, instead they're talking about what inspired them to start a charismatic church denomination stream here in the UK in the 1980s. Fascinating conversation between two really interesting people. That's between four and five, straight after today's programme. Uh, but right now, let me tell you what's coming up on Unbelievable if you come back next week. You're unbelievable. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we haven't quite decided. Uh, it might be that we arrange a discussion on the uh, historical Jesus. Uh, the latest person to come up with a mythical theory of Jesus is a guy called Joseph Atwill. He's in London this coming week uh, propounding it at a symposium. Uh, he claims that the Romans invented Jesus. Well, uh, we'll see if we can get him on with someone. But if that doesn't come off, uh, I've got a great discussion I want to play out for you too. Hannah Hart is a humanist celebrant. She'll be in discussion with Faith Forster, church leader, about human rights of passage and how an atheist marks them compared to a Christian. Either way, it's worth coming back. Hope you can do that. 2.30pm next Saturday here on Premier Christian Radio or via the podcast at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. Until then, have a great week.